he sniffed one of the three chicks, explaining that <laughs> this type of bird had a characteristic scent or perfume before the birds were weighed, sexed and ringed. But a viewer, a viewer contacted... Sound like hellfire on a Sunday. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Hang on. Hello, Zan. Hello, Miff. Nice to see you. Nice to see you in the flesh. Face to face. Face to face. Yay. You said you were moving to Brisbane, but you couldn't stay away. Two weeks you? later, I'm back in <laughs> Melbourne. Not permanently. No. Just doing a little gig this morning little before gig Bang this morning, On. A little breakfast gig. A little pre bang. And I noticed a heaps of bang fame were at that gig in Geelong as well. I noticed that. Um, very early gigs are not great for me anymore. Oh, yeah. Because I got out of bed and I went, oh, I've got a couple of pillow lines. You know, when you go to sleep and it creases? Yeah. They don't go off your face for it until at I least know. nine. <laughs> and if something starts at seven, you kind of walk. You, there's nothing wrong. You just look weird. The bounce back of collagen is long gone. <laughs> Can I say, um, and this I'm not going to say the brand because, you know, it's an ABC podcast, but I got sucked into that world the other day of Instagram ads of the silicon patches that they put. <gasps> have you tried like, it? You don't need to have Botox, just stick it on your forehead. And I was like, I've got a few lines, I'll do that. I haven't tried it yet because I bought it stupidly. I was in a weakened state and, you know, mm. when you buy it immediately from Instagram and it does it all too Regret. quickly and easily for you. Um, but I didn't realise, I thought it would like plump up your skin, but it just stops it from creasing further. Oh. So you're just sticking like, it's like sticking gaffer on your forehead or your chest or wherever you want to under your eyes and it just stops it from <laughs> being squished by your pillow or whatever and, and, and creasing further. Do you wear it at night only? You wear it at night. So it's like wearing like the teeth things. A retainer. A retainer. <laughs> it's a retainer for your face. Why don't they just put us in glad wrap, <laughs> essentially, so at night nothing moves. $75 well spent. Still in the packet under the sink at home. I wanted the chest one because yeah. I'm, I'm getting the, you know, the, the crepey. The decolletage. Decolletage. Yeah. I'm getting the crepey vibe going on. That's what it's there for. And, it, and so all it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't put any Stick some glad wrap there. oils and clean. Yeah, just some glad wrap. A bit of cardboard and some glad wrap will do Super the same glue. job. <laughs> Get out your craft box. Yeah. You don't need to spend seventy dollars. You can spend five dollars down at the local supermarket. <laughs> uh, I fell for it. I'll let you know how that goes when I finally use it. It's probably going to live under my sink forever. Bang on is your place for music, art, life, and stuff. Life hacks. Mm, Everything and plastic else in things you can put on your face at night. <laughs> Speaking of which, if you don't use it, can I have it, please? Yes, you can. You absolutely okay. can. I've Thank got you. lots of them under my sink. <laughs> Uh, but speaking of plastic things, very bad segue. Uh, and just like that, which wound up last week, I think, the week before. When was it? Time has no meaning. We did a big season finale wrap of the Sex and the City reboot, which is now up to season two. <laughs> there were a lot of emails to the bang box. And I need to kick off with a correction because Bang Fam were aghast that we didn't know who mm. Annabelle Bronstein was. And we're sorry. We We've are got sorry. memories like sieves. Yeah. We'll Our faces that. crease when we sleep. That's right. But hang We're on. getting on. It was also years ago, and if you haven't watched that specific episode, you might not remember, but it is actually the episode where, um, oh, my God, see, there you go. Samantha. Samantha. See, I can't, I, I can't remember if I've got my keys at the moment, so let alone remember something that happened years ago. It's where Samantha is really hot in New York, and she manages to get – entry into Soho House, which is a members-only club mm. in New York City that has a rooftop pool. And the card, the name on the card that she gets in with is Annabelle Bronstein. Mm. And we forgot. And Annabelle Bronstein is British. That's right. And when it's discovered that she's not in fact Annabelle Bronstein, she tries on a really bad British accent mm -hmm. and still gets booted out. This is the Annabelle Bronstein reference because, of course, Kim Cattrall has been living in the UK for a while now. I think she's got British heritage, doesn't she? I think she's Canadian. <laughs> what are we this doing? Great like, podcast. What, come what, along, come along for the ride. Why are we hosting out? a pop culture podcast? We know nothing, and if we do, Can we I forget Google? it. Can we, I Google? Oh yeah, Miff Google. I've got please. fourteen percent left on my computer. <laughs> um, Kim Cattrall. <laughs> uh, C isn't it? Cattrall. Wiki. Yep. Canadian actress. There you go. Yeah. Well, she's part of the colonies, so let's That's call right. her British. That's right. There you go. <laughs> Anyway, we were wrong. Oh, no, she is British and Canadian. There I don't know go. how that works. Yeah. But yeah, so there it is. There's the there's the correction. So sorry. Apparently, she also met Ginger Spice in that episode. I don't remember that at all. I don't think I've seen that episode. I have seen that. But episode. I have it. I have the box set on DVD, or at least I did until I lent it to someone. Whoever I lent it to, 
actually don't. I don't have a DVD player. I don't you want, don't it, want back. it back. But it went <laughs> went somewhere <laughs> someday, and I've never seen it again. So I must have seen that episode. It's completely been lost to my memory. Yeah, no, I, I've seen it a lot. And I should have remembered. As witnessed and heard by tens of thousands of Bang Fam last week. Thank you for all of your emails. We appreciate it. Yeah, Before we right. move into everything that we're going to get wrong this week, Miff, I wanted just to <laughs> thank everyone for continuing to give you great tips about what to wear and how to survive the humid weather in Brisbane as a new local. And also, I've been forwarding them along to you. Mm. Just so many great emails in general. I just wanted to shout out Julia, who is a long-time listener, first-time writer. Absolutely adore Bang On, says Julia. Just wanted to send a massive shout-out to whoever shared the deodorant under your boobs. Life-changing tip for me. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Admittedly, I don't know how to get there anymore. <laughs> it's gone too far for that. Because you're storing other things uh, under there, remember? Right. That's right. A small <laughs> possum has nested <laughs> under there. It's a nice <laughs> Become... It's happened. This is what happens when we reunite in the same room again. It's a little hard to get the deodorant stick under there these days. But anyway, look, we'll give it a go. It is a genius idea. Whoever came up with that, that needs to be celebrated worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. It takes a village and we appreciate all of your tips, Bang Fam, and banging back to us all the time. Yeah. On to this week. Lots to get through. We are going to talk about Burning Man, among other things, but the... The blogs, are there blogs anymore? I don't know. The the Instagrams, the gossip rags, everything online, everyone's talking about the confirmation, rumours around Kylie Jenner and Timothy Chalamet, Shamalamale, as we like to call him, mm. dating, were confirmed. Mm. And not just confirmed, but in a very public way, at Beyonce's birthday concert when she was on stage, one of a handful of gigs she did in Los Angeles, it was on the day of her birthday, and Tim and Kylie, that's what I call them, they're friends, were up in the VIP box and getting pretty handsy with each other. They were getting pretty handsy. They looked into each other and he was smoking a cigarette in an indoor venue. I'm not sure what kind of celebrity gets away with that a these French days. A French one. Really? <laughs> a French celebrity who lives in New York, which is Timothy Chamalamale. And ashing just down on the ground because you know those boxes, you've seen, you've been to Beyonce, they're, they're literally like on the... They're not even on the stage. They're in the crowd, aren't yeah, they? So yeah. he was essentially just ashing on the people below. The people. <laughs> the hoi polloi. That's right. <laughs> the oh, riffraff. The riffraff. The riffraff. That was the sense I got. I love that and vibe I, as well. I was looking at the video going, but which Kardashian is she? And that sounds terrible because I've been across the Kardashians, but it's become such a blur now. I don't know the difference between the two younger ones anymore. I've well, lost... they've all had a lot of similar work done, I guess. Well, yeah, but it's not even that. I just, it's all just starting to meld into one, I think, because and they all begin with K. So much <laughs> going on, and there's always so many different relationships and people and things, and it's too much. All I know is that Chris Jenner is a master manipulator of the media, and whether or not this relationship is actually real doesn't matter. They've managed to make it work. They've got their new series on Disney these days, I mm. think. So obviously they need some new narratives. This is going to be a good one because the Travis Scott one wasn't a great narrative, to be honest. Um, so they've got a, a it's more people's lives. It's their storyline. Yeah, exactly. So they've got a they've got a positive storyline here. They've got someone who brings a little bit of indie cred yes. to the storyline, which in the same way. I think Kim gained when she hooked up with Kanye. Mm. And that's a similar trajectory, I think. She went from Forever 21 to Dolce & Gabbana, exactly. didn't she? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I say bring back Forever 21, Kimmy. <laughs> I'm into that. It's more attainable, more accessible. I reckon some of the conversation around this, though, is a little bit off. And I will say this. I don't have much time for the Kardashians. I find that when – I think I told you once that I, I was on holidays and I walked past a screen that they were on and I got – sucked into a show and I and I woke in a fugue state about 20 minutes later mm. and I didn't realise what had happened. There's something really draining but also addictive about watching them and I feel hollow afterwards. I unfollowed all of them on social media because they don't make me feel good about myself. I think that even though I know it's all airbrushed and there's been a lot of money and work that's gone into the way that they look, I still just don't – like it It's not doesn't bring me joy so I'm like, nah, unfollow. But – I love that you Murray kondo them. <laughs> Murray Kondo, the Kardashians. Oh, get, 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 get out. And I'm happier for it. <laughs> oh, side note, side bang, you know that years ago when that was all the rage, I did the whole Murray Kondo rolling of the mm. underwear. How's that, that going for I you? I still do it. No. I still do it. 
All right, bow down to you. <laughs> mine, mine lasted a week. A week. I'm not surprised. That's why we're different people and we complement each other perfectly. That's correct. We we lift we where lift. there are where there are dips in each of us. We're a seesaw. Bang on but is I'm a seesaw. Sure, I'm not sure what my strengths are, to be honest. I if I can't keep a sock draw together. You got plenty of strengths, babes. Oh. But I reckon one of the sort of more sinister sides of this conversation is I've seen a few people posting about how um he has been Timothy Chalamet has been Chalamet, sorry I should say, has been um manipulated by this machine that is the mm. Kardashian Jenners, by the momager that is Chris Jenner, and that he's been drawn into this web and exploited. And I'm like, you know what? He is a grown man. He's absolutely getting some. He can make all of these decisions himself. Why is it always that there's this kind of sinister, clever, evil woman manipulating a man narrative that comes into these stories? Mm. He is of sound mind. And he knows what he's doing and he's dating someone and they're having a nice time and dot, 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 let's see what happens. Mm. Don't blame it on the female part of this relationship. That mm. just seems, I think, that people Well, start... I just did. I said it was her mum. <laughs> <laughs> it just it confirms a lot of, like, yeah. weird things, don't you reckon, yeah. about, like, women being manipulators and mm. and being a little bit sneaky and, and getting into things for... Um, not so noble or well, at least, you know, root-worthy causes. Interestingly enough, though, historically that was the only thing that women could do because they did not hold positions of power. They did not hold positions in government. They weren't allowed to hold positions in church, still not allowed. And these were pillars of society where decisions were made and power was enforced. So really, traditionally, that is the only way that women could get any kind of power necessarily within the home and within their community. So I'm not saying that's the only way, but I think historically it was probably one of the things that actually was a powerful thing. So the Kardashian Jenners are holding up a bastion of history and history. using whatever's within their wheel. History, I know. It's I was awful. not expecting and this we, rebuttal. I love it. And we have moved on. We have absolutely moved on, but I think we hold those very internalised yeah. understandings of what, women's roles are and I think that's where it comes from. Yeah. It's time to go. Time get, to go. Get rid of it all. And Although also, Chris Jenner is still a master manipulator and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally sus on how this all came together. But anyway. Don't ash on people as well, Tim. Do totally. not ash on people. Bring your own ashtray. Do you remember those? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember there was um, the film canisters? Yeah, People used to ash oh into God. their film canisters You did that when 90s. you had your Stuyvesant soft pack, didn't totally, you? Totally. You you, you, that is so you. That's so you in the 90s. I've got a film canister because I have just dropped off a roll to get developed. And disgusting. It's too. shot in a black film, and white. A film canister in your handbag, the stench <laughs> of that thing. <laughs> Full of ash. Very horny time in the world right now. If you've seen those images. Can oh, I nice segue. What, what are we going to talk about now? Well, I just wanted to give a side bang to another big horny moment from Friday. Oh, my God, touch me right there. Almost there, touch me right there. Don't be shy, but I don't bite. You know where, touch me right there. New Kylie Minogue single. Nothing more to say than it's just a horny banger. Totally. Just really, like, oh my God, touch me right there. Have you seen the video? No. She's, she's manhandling a joystick in oh, a beautiful good. way. Very good. Oh, good. Good. Oh, good. Good. Enjoying her midlife, Kylie is. Love it. Um, from Kylie Minogue to Burning Man, pretty sure this is not a festival that she would have ever attended. Not really her vibe, yeah? I think she would. I, the people who You're are Kylie least, Minogue's a burner. <laughs> yeah, I think she could be. The people who are least likely to go to Burning Man seem to be the ones that turn up year after year. I mean, who thought Chris Rock was going to be there this year? <laughs> who thought? I mean, no, Diplo would always be there every, <laughs> every year and probably has been since the beginning of time. But can we had Casey Donovan there this year. Casey Donovan was giving us reports from the ground. Mm. She was the only Australian that I knew that was at Burning Man. Mm. I follow her on socials, so I saw her with um, her face mask, which I think in Burning Man really protects you from a lot of the dust because it is generally yeah. a pretty dusty place. It's out there on a big plane in Nevada. It's called the Playa. It's a huge flat space. Oh, is that how you say it? I just went the Playa. <laughs> The player. Very what, cold is, what, is the player, what does the player the mean? The player. I think it it's like it, I would assume that it's a Spanish language word for um, some sort of plane. Should oh. we Google? Yeah, let's do What's that. Playa? because what is playa No, mean? before we do, let's guess what player. I reckon it's I reckon it's another word for plane. What does Or a collection of wits in the mean? desert. <laughs> what does player mean in Spanish? I mean we're talking about Nevada, so you've got a big um Oh it means beach. 
Oh, inland sea. <laughs> inland sea. But is there an inland sea? Well, that's what the desert would would have been originally, an okay. inland sea. All right. There Hence you go. the sand. We're really learning a lot today, aren't we? we We're are. teaching Thank you, Google. teaching each other things and learning things mm. in real time. Mm. But this was a big, usually kind of dusty place and on Friday last weekend. Burning Man got 13 millimetres of rain in a matter of hours. Now, just to give you context, that part of Nevada generally gets five millimetres of rain across the whole of September. Massive dump, turned everything to mud. We've seen it all before. In fact, I would argue that we're seeing it more and more at big Mm. outdoor festivals, these huge weather events that are quote-unquote unseasonable but are becoming more and more seasonable or regular or new normal. And the kind of conversations around... 70,000 people not being able to leave, toilets not being able to be cleaned and the burner vibes still going off. A lot of people were sort of sitting back and rubbing their hands together and enjoying this, weren't they? They were enjoying the fact that that people were trapped. People who wanted to go there willingly to find themselves, ad guys, corporate tech guys. and Not, not the, all. Not all, but some. Not I, all corporate tech guys. <laughs> yeah, but that, I think that's what they're rubbing their hands in glee about. It's not the other people that go to Burning Man for the art installations or, you know, that that have lived this life for a long time. I think it's the people that are new adopters, I think, to the, the lifestyle that is Burning Man. I was surprised it's been going since 1986. Mm. Not at that site, but it's been around for a long time and has always been considered an arts and countercultural festival. Yeah. It's not a festival where they've got... Big names playing. It's you know, there's art. There's people trading a bartering system. You probably would have heard that as well. Yeah. That you, there's no cash exchanged. It's all about trading and sharing and generosity and stripping the uh, perils of modern life from you. But yeah, there's been this real rise in Silicon Valley tech bros coming mm. there to find themselves, or as some people put it, rich people pretending to be poor yeah. for <laughs> a good week or week and a half. I've got no money. And it must every- be so difficult. And then as soon as it started raining, get me home. Well, it was kind but of... you would want to get out. I did see Casey's um, videos that she put up mm. on stories on Instagram. They're no longer available. And it did look pretty... It would be hard it would be hard. I've been. Oh, look! I've been to Meredith when it's rained a lot. Did not enjoy. It's Wanted hard to, to get walk out of on there. that kind of mud. Like it exhausts you, and also just not knowing when you're going to be able to get mm. out. I think the loss of control. You can't drive your car. You can't leave. Are people going to come and get you? Are we going to be okay? Yeah, as I, soon as that's taken away, you start getting a bit anxious. Yeah, of course. I'd be an anxious mess by the time anyone got me out of there. But there were no helicopters flying in. I would have assumed all the richer folk would have got their you know, whatever they own, helicopter transport to get them. Chris Rock, Chris Rock and Diplo walked 10 kilometres and then hitched a ride in the back of someone's pickup truck. Oh. Stars, Can you they're imagine? just like us. Can you just they're just like us, toilet paper and get <laughs> and have to walk 5Ks to get out of a festival. Well, we've all, I mean, we've all missed the last tram home and then thought we can walk it, a bit yeah. pissed, we can walk it three hours <laughs> later, still walking, we can do this. Um, but that, that kind of feeling of being, you know, I guess laughing. The sh- is it Schadenfreude? Schadenfreude. 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 I can't really know absolutely this nothing this week. Terrible <laughs> podcast. I would not listen. Don't recommend. Someone fire us. One star. <laughs> laughing at other people's misery uh, is something that a lot of people have been doing. And Moira Donegan actually captured this in a very, very fitting piece in The Guardian, which I just caught up with, titled, Yes, It's Okay to Laugh at Wealthy Burning Man Attendees Mired in Muck. She acknowledges that the Burning Man Festival has a history of counterculture and, you know, hippie attendees and there's, she's got no qualms with them, have a great time. But it's this rise of the tech bros and particularly, I think, people who are not accountable in real life, people who have increasingly the same power and uh, the same influence as elected officials And yet they've done that through becoming billionaires, through various means, through being in the right place at the right time, through being very smart or clever or just um, (laughs) luck of the draw or inheritance. And these people are completely unregulated. Their wealth is largely untaxed. And so at Burning Man, they go to find themselves to pretend to be poor to get back to base level, but the world that they've created outside of Burning Man, the world of social media that makes us feel disconnected, Mm. they're seeking connection at Burning Man and yet they've created the very thing Mm. that's making us turn against each other, that's making us, like I do when I look at the Kardashians, feel like shit, Mm. all that sort of stuff. That's what they've created. 
So I really love this piece because it made me feel better about having a little chuckle. And I did feel... I did feel really bad for people who are at the Burning Man Festival because yeah. no one wants to be in that situation. But, yeah, these wealthy tech bros who have created, you know, in many cases some amazing products but in a lot of cases also a lot of misery and profited hugely for it. It's kind of nice to see them in the in the dust and in the mur- mud and, and de- <laughs> dealing with muddy shoes and what it's like to actually walk somewhere because your private driver can't actually get through. And apparently there was some sort of Ebola-type virus, not Ebola as such. Myth, but like- no, that was a rumour. <laughs> you just, I mean, did you, why did I think that was a rumour. It got set through social media. I know, I know. I love it. I love it that there was sort of, there possibly a boil-type disease. <laughs> oh, look, come and check out my boil. What's your highlight of Burning Man, my boil? In six to eight weeks, we're going to see some stories about more of those bot flies just being oh, pulled out of people's was? brains. Was it a bot fly thing? Was it a boil thing? Do we need to look that up? No, we don't need to look it up. Don't Google bot fly. Oh, that's disgusting. <sighs> They're all safe now. Very big week as well for the voice campaign and specifically the campaign for Yes gifted this huge song from Farnsey who has never given the rights to anyone ever. And he gifted it, seems like free of charge, to the Yes campaign for the voice to Parliament. Mm. What a massive Australian anthem to gift to this campaign. I think he's come out of... Uh, his recovery, obviously had a cancer diagnosis recently, and he's just decided I'm going to do what I want to do with my music and this is what he wants to do and all power to him. And what makes me laugh is all the the so-called fans on social media, whether or not you agree with the yes vote or not, doesn't matter. These fans or so-called fans, they make me laugh because they're like, we're never buying John Farnham's music again. We're never going to go to his concerts again. Pretty sure he's not going to release <laughs> any more new music, and I think he knows that. And concerts probably out of the question. It, it's it's as if the people on social media feel like they wield some power or some influence, and it's like he knows that they don't, and it's going to have no effect on the sales of of his music. And I, I just think there's more power in that itself. It's like all this blah 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 and media printing all these dissenting views about what John Farnham's done. I'm like, he don't care. Well, he knows the power of that song. Yes. And he knows the power of that song as being a uniting anthem. Yeah. When I was looking into this this week for some of my other jobs, I actually dug into the history of this song, and I'm ashamed to say that I never knew this, but the song was written by some British songwriters and it was brought to Farnham via one of the members of Ice House, actually. He was a British guitarist. And it was a protest song. Like, it was a protest song that was written after a couple of songwriters basically meant to go to a nuclear disarmament rally in London and Mm. Hyde Park. They slept in. They felt really bad. They're watching this protest on television, feeling this moment with this mass of people all standing up for something that they believe in. And that's what is the seed of inspiration for You're the Voice. And they write this song with that in mind. You would know that if you'd watched the John Farnham documentary that I banged on about a couple of weeks ago. (laughs) You know that I came in and watched that and I came in right at the point where they were talking about You're the Voice, so I missed the first like half hour. So so I'm like, have you heard, Miff? Yeah. <laughs> in one of the biggest music documentaries of the year, which has been explained. But in case you missed it. <laughs> I love it. Love so it. for any Bang fan who also missed the first half hour, that was for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, we know nothing, as I've said before. But, yeah, it's kind of like I think it's um, music has power and we know that because music is used in political rallies and political advertisements and um, campaigns and has been for decades in some cases whether artists like it or not. This is a chance for John Farnham to go, here's the song that basically changed the trajectory of my career that is has become the unofficial Australian mm. national anthem, is a great unifier, and I choose to gift it to the Yes campaign. And that has power. And the the advertisement that Warwick Thornton uh, basically short film directed, that three-minute advertisement, has power. You can see who it's speaking to. So... It's been really interesting to see as the campaigns both settle in and officially kick off what they're going with. And I did love that Megan Davis, who was one of the co-authors of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, when she was talking about 
the fact that they had this and you could see how chuffed she was to finally be able to share it. She's like, yeah, look, for the last few months, people have been saying, oh, you, sh- you should use your voice. Mm. <laughs> she's just she's like, we know. Ima- imagine just having to like keep the lid on it and be like, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll put a call in to, to Farnsey and see what he thinks. <laughs> The be- it's actually one I'm of the so best- shit at keeping secrets. It's I one would of the be best like, We've kept got secrets. It. It's one of the best kept secrets. Like that, they, they held onto that so tightly, and there would have been so many people working on it as a project, and yet they managed it. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So there you go, Fanzi gifting that song for the first time ever. Um, not selling it. I'm just hoping he's going to gift burn for you for me. <laughs> burn. What context? Oh, just in ter- just as a gift. Yeah, this is for you from me. I'm sure he's... <laughs> the other hour and a half of the film that I did see when I saw uh, Finding the Voice, the brilliant John Farnham documentary, of which I will catch up on the first bit of it mm. very soon, it just reminded me of how many big hits he had. Oh, I thought you were going to say how, how many big hairstyles he had. <laughs> <laughs> And how many soft blow wave mullets he, he captured in his career. There were so many hits. So many and hits. And his voice was so beautiful. Mm. It is so beautiful. Like, yeah. it's just... It's nice to be reminded of that. So big year for Farnsey and um, and what a way to kind of get into the final third of it with gifting this song. Very big music news this week. Now, we are your place for music, art, life and stuff, but we also love talking animals. Mm. Weirdly have got a lot of animal things to talk about. I just want to ask you, you sent me a... A, an article this week, which you know what I didn't even read because you're like it's worth it for the just for the headline, headline alone. <laughs> I know I need to click on the story because I've lost it. Hang on a sec, <laughs> give me two secs. Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> oh yeah, here we go. Okay, the headline. Mm. Sorry, ABC Internet bit slow. <laughs> <laughs> I just went. Oh my god, I'm in. <laughs> I don't know who Chris Packham is. I I've I know now. But it said, Chris Packham reported to police for sniffing bird on The One Show. <laughs> now, The One Show is a show in, in the UK. It's a, it's early in the evening, five o'clock or something. And um, they get all sorts of guests. It's a it's a magazine style show. It's like the drum, but a bit lighter and, um, you know. A bit more bird sniffy. A bit more bird <laughs> sniffy. <laughs> Oh Why was he sniffing the bird? Well, TV wildlife expert Chris Packham <laughs> has been reported to police after footage of him sniffing a baby bird was screened by the BBC. <laughs> Mr Packham, who li- this is from the Daily Echo, the Southern Daily Echo, I'm not sure. What, what, what is this publication it, as well? It's probably a very unreputable publication or it could be a very like serious horse one. horse and hound or something? Um, probably. <laughs> who lives in the New Forest, was presenting an item on the one show about how Goshawks are making Gosh Is it Goshawks or Goshawks? No. Oh, no. Do I have to look it up? <laughs> anyway, a bird are making a comeback <laughs> after coming close to extinction. He sniffed one of the three chicks, explaining that this type of bird had a characteristic scent or perfume before the birds were weighed, sexed and ringed. But a viewer, a viewer contacted... Sound like hellfire on a Sunday. Exactly, exactly. But a viewer contacted police and alleged that the 62-year-old broadcaster had disturbed the rare woodland predators, Aww. which are now protected by law. Uh, and then they obviously uh, currently reviewed... Uh, he is now being... Oh, hang on. The police spokesperson said, we received a report relating to an alleged offence under the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 and it is currently being reviewed by our Country Watch team. Uh, Mr Packham denied doing it. (laughs) (laughs) He said... It's political correctness gone mad. That's right. Why can't you sniff a bird? He's gone to say when it comes to this type of bird's welfare, we ought to worry a little less about naturalists (laughs) having a sniff occasionally... And more about the widespread persecution of these species. <laughs> Look, I understand this. I side with Chris. I don't know how many times you sniff your animals, but Norman, Always. after a little nap, he just smells Cute. like a little baby. Yeah. The post-nap smell. A little warm, little smell. Yeah. You can tell we don't have children. <laughs> exactly. Smell his head. Well, it's, a very, it's a very big thing with children. Two newborns have a certain yeah. smell yeah. that comes out of their the top of their heads. I reckon cats do as well. You reckon? Yeah. You're, or we're just weirdos. <laughs> 
I think we're just weirdos. Who doesn't love burying their face in their cat's belly and having Aww. a big kiss and a sniff? No, Creepy? No. Not at all. It's full of love. So you're not connecting with the mouth, I think. <laughs> Everything, and, and, you know. I've seen where that mouth goes. I'm not yeah, connecting no, with the mouth. No, none of that. I'm not into that, but yeah. Well, I want to see your bird sniffer and raise you a koala that's been caught red-handed. Red-clawed, I should say. And his <laughs> name is Claude because apparently oh. he has quite big talons. Humphrey Harrington, that is someone's real name. Humphrey Her- Harrington, who's the owner of a plant nursery near Lismore, noticed that his seedlings were being chewed overnight. Thought it was oh. a possum. I've had that before. Very annoying. I mean, I could put some sort of shield over it, but no, I just wait just for the possums, the possums to eat. You're just putting out, eat everything that I've just grown. You're just putting grown. out a buffet. <laughs> Basically. All you can eat. It's like sizzler at your place. It's for the, the sizzler. Possums. Yeah, it's the sizzler. And yeah. there's always cheesy garlic bread on offer. <laughs> But uh, soon it was realised that it was actually, no, not a possum, but Claude the koala. Quote, one morning we came out to work and Claude was sitting on a bench next to all these plants, just wrapped around a pole. It seemed like he'd had a really big feed that night, so I think he was too full to go up and climb his tree. (laughs) Oh, He's He's feasted on the buffet too hard. He's like that picture of the possum that went into the bakery and ate all the donuts. Do you remember that? No. He just sat there with a huge gut and he just, there's a photo of him behind all the donuts. And he's just like, he's, he's been, it's like he's been at Sizzler all he can eat too. It, and it's the most fun, it's the most beautiful photo. But this little guy, you can see they've taken a photo of him. He's just hanging onto a telephone pole. He's very far down that telephone pole. Yeah. He's not climbing up. He's no. very heavy. He's had a big feed. Yeah. You know how big a feed he's had? Yeah. It's alleged, and this is an allegation, so I've got to say it's alleged. The leaf thief, as they've called him, oh. consumed several thousand seedlings over the course of his crime spree and has cost the business up to $6,000. And here is the kicker. The seedlings that he's eaten were actually supposed to be sold to farmers and land care groups that are particularly for koala habitat. Oh, no. <laughs> so he's gone in and gone, all of this will be mine. <laughs> Oh, he's no. jumped. He's jumped the the fence. He's gone. It's not going out into the habitat. My mates are going to get on board with this. I need to stop it right at the beginning. <laughs> I'm having all of the seedlings. Claude the koala, Good a boy. thief. <sighs> Amazing. But that's not the only uh, animal news we have this oh, week. It doesn't end here. <laughs> Um, my favourite, the Peregrine Falcons of Melbourne are back. Oh my God, the Collins Street Peregrine Falcons. That's right. They are back. There is a couple. Two birds, and they have now, uh, as of today, laid two eggs. She has. He's around, um, and we're not sure if it's the same couple from last year. And, of course, remember the drama of last year where the original dad, Dive Bomb Dad, was was taken over, and it was pretty horrific, actually, but this is nature. I think he was knocked out officially by this other fellow who then just started to believe that he was the parent um, of these eggs that had been laid. And it's Timothy Chamelay coming into the situation. Swooping Kylie into Jenner, the situation. The Dive on day became That's right. Travis Scott. That's right. He's out. Um, so we have a new drama unfolding and we have two cameras on both ends of the nest. Normally it was only on one end and they would change it over if the eggs were moved or the chicks were moving. But now we've got two, we've got vision, both sides are going to know exactly what's going on. I've got two months free in my calendar. I am (laughs) good to go. I'm good to go. For anybody who doesn't know what the hell you're talking about, if you have just started listening to Bang On this week and are thoroughly confused, so are we. It's a live feed. It's a live feed of peregrine Peregrine falcons, falcons, which generally live quite high up, don't they? So they're in like a Collins Street, top end of yeah. Melbourne CBD, Collins Street skyscraper, and they've set up these cameras because they're quite a rare bird, aren't they? But they do love skyscrapers. They mm. love being in the city and they've you know, now set up over years mm. this live view of them hatching their, their young. And That's right. And people big drama unfolding. really get involved and really – enjoy watching the growth of the little babies and seeing them come to come to life and then you know growing up and flying off and, and, and waiting it, for someone to sniff them that's right we can't sniff them up there allegedly but i love that their parents have embraced the, the you know the inner city lifestyle <laughs> in a city they're like you know <laughs> nature we're gonna go we're gonna live in the city we're gonna they've put in a supermarket now we don't have to leave we're gonna go to south bank <laughs> on a sunday Anytime we want, really. The bars are open late. That's right. We love it. We love the night time. We love the laneways. Well, I'm going to put... They a... love laneways. 
Peregrine Falcon's <laughs> love laneway culture. That's right. Uh, and Melbourne has a lot of laneway culture. I'm going to put up a link to that live stream if anybody wants to get on board. It is more captivating than you can imagine. And I'm very excited that you're going to be, um, well, for the next two, ye- two years, sorry, two, two months. Two months or so. Life. It goes for a while. And look, it is, it is traumatic sometimes. It really yeah. is reality. There are, there are deaths. There are, you know, there's a lot of murdered birds that get, come up for dinner. It's, it's quite gruesome watching at times. Oh, because they're carnivores, the yes, peregrine falcons. Course. They bring, just slop a, a dead pigeon out there for everyone to have a go at. Maybe not one for the vegans and the vegetarians. No, then. no, no. Probably not. Well, thank you for that update. No worries. On a totally different tip, you shared with me one of the best reads I've experienced in quite a while this week in The New Yorker, which has always got great reads. I love this. Yeah, Joe Garcia is the writer of a piece called Listening to Taylor Swift in Prison. And it's essentially his experience. He is still in prison in America. I think he's in He's been in all of the ones that you'd know, Rikers Island. He's he's in there for murder, and he's been there been like twenty years. Twenty right? years, yeah. twenty years. He's looking to be let out on parole very very soon, uh, and whether or not he'll achieve that, we don't know. But he's been listening to Taylor Swift for his, you know, however long she's been making music, and he talks about his experiences of listening to her while he's in prison, and and the thoughts that he has while he's listening to her music and the ideas and how it relates to his own life and it's I guess it's two things I would never put together like a a murderer in prison listening to music the music of Taylor Swift which is essentially the world of young women mm. and or, and older women of course too and I mean there's lots of fans but this is a very specific person in a very specific situation that I guess you wouldn't really assume would be real but as as we found out there are other Swifties in prison too and it's just a I don't know it it had so much heart and positivity and there was no shying away from what he'd done no shying away at all uh, I think an acknowledgement of what he'd done and the regret around that and the fact that he'd never take that back and he'd never he'd never uh he 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 could never forgive himself for what he did to that person and their family, um, and also what happened to his own family. He talks a lot about that because the the way that he makes sense of the world is through her lyrics, mm. and you see the power of that. It reminds you of what an incredible lyricist she is. Like it's it's a connection. He finds a connection through her music that he doesn't experience elsewhere because it is obviously a very isolated environment. Yeah. And for many years he's living in this environment where he doesn't have necessarily a radio or if he's got a radio he's got to plug in some shitty little it's really hard to come earbuds by. and mm. then he loses that when he's transferred to another prison it's almost like a as well a time stamp because he talks about getting a mini disc player and then getting a cd and it's just a boom box it gives you the full sense of the time mm. and what a life sentence is and yeah. how this artist who has been writing songs since she was a young teenager has soundtracked his life it's just it's such a remarkable piece. He's also a beautiful writer. Yeah. Like, it just hit me for six, this piece, because I think, I don't know if we've spoken about this before. I'm sure we have. I'm not a mad Taylor Swift fan. I respect her as a songwriter, but, mm. you know, like, and I say mad because, like, people who love Taylor Swift. Love Taylor just Swift. Just love Taylor Swift. Yeah. And as soon as I read this, I sent this to a mate of mine who loves Taylor Swift, and she loved it. But I understand and respect that she is an incredible songwriter and one of the greatest of our times, of all time, of contemporary music. Um, but... Seeing it and experiencing it through his gaze and how he understood the world and felt remorse and felt that pull, you know, of of lost loves and lost Mm. family, it just gave it so much more weight for me. It was just beautiful. It did. And I think too, as weird as this is, it reminded me of a simpler time when I think about when we were kids and we had to wait for things. When music would come in dribs and drabs, you didn't have it all there to to be able to connect with it. There was something as horrible as it is to be incarcerated and not have access to 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 the things that you may want or need, and that is part of the incarceration process. Um, there was something about it being valuable and music being valuable, and and it having a healing effect. It having a power that I think we don't really see so much anymore because there is so much more 
of it. Mm. Like Swifties have it because mm. they love it and they just want every little morsel and every little nugget and and they'll they'll super fixate on her songs. But most people who are going through life now, music is more of a soundtrack. We're a lot more, we're much more of a passenger. And I think this article, there's something about it. When you read it, you're like, oh, like there's there's so much value in these things if we spend time with them. Yeah. And there was a, that was a real reminder. And, and it's such a strange juxtaposition. It, it, I'm reminded by a man, a murderer in prison. Like it's, yeah, there, there's a lot going on in here and I just think it's worth reading for, for so many of those reasons. Um, this came from Daniel A. Gross on, on, on Twitter who said, Joe Garcia, the, the author of the piece, just called me from prison. I read him some of the reactions to his unforgettable New Yorker essay about Taylor Swift. He was surprised and happy and he said, I wish I could see the response in real time. Honestly, I just love writing this stuff, Joe said. And uh, the tweet goes on to say, I, I'm still calling them tweets. I'm not calling them whatever else you're supposed to call them, exes. He's grateful to his readers and already thinking about his next story. He said that of all the reactions he's gotten, one of the most important came from his sweetheart's mum. She loved the piece. Oh, It's so beautiful. Yeah. Encourage everyone to read it. We'll put it in the show notes. It's the best thing I've read this week. Thank you for sending it my way. I just loved it. Mm. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. What are you banging on about this week? Oh, speaking of love, my gosh, I watched this documentary not expecting to have as many feelings as I did. I watched it on the plane as I came from Brisbane to Melbourne last night. Love it. I'm pretty sure that whoever was sitting near me probably thought I had some problems (laughs) because I could not sit still while I was watching it. Okay. And it's a documentary that came out a couple of years ago. I don't know how I missed it. But maybe it's sort of something I thought, oh, I'll just watch because I didn't think it was going to affect me as much as it did. It's the Bee Gees documentary. Yes. And it's called How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, which is one of their huge hits, but one of their gazillion hits. And this is the thing. I think we all knew that the Bee Gees were from England, grew up in Australia, started their career here, went back to England, had that phase, their kind of early sort of Beatlesque rock and roll phase. But what this does is chart all of their phases and they were so numerous, it is astounding. You just go, oh, oh shit, that's right. They've got all of these songs and then there's that song and then there's the next song and then you get the awesome disco era Mm. songs, which was, of course, Saturday Night Fever and all of those tracks that that you know and love and all the outfits. My God, I was living for the outfits. They're white suits, you know, like the very tight tight pants and bomber jackets and (laughs) it's just f***ing hot. Like... (laughs) It's the hottest era in terms of how everybody looked and kind of felt and I, I loved it, absolutely loved it for that. The hairstyles, amazing, incredible bonces. It was probably pre-blow dry but still like a lot of full hair. bonces? Bonces, that's what America, um, English call heads, bonce. <laughs> I never heard that Have before. Have you not heard Bonds? See, we don't know much, but you know Bonds. <laughs> I know Bonds. It's pretty good. Um, and so there's just so much good stuff in there, but there's some fabulous ideas too, and I think this hasn't been communicated enough, and it's something we've talked about here on Bang On, about the the damage that death to disco movement did. And this, I actually saw footage around it that I hadn't seen, and I also saw people talking about it in a way that I think it really reinforced the effect of that damaging campaign. And the Bee Gees, of course, were at the centre of that mm. because they were seen as the pin-up boys for disco. And essentially what that campaign of death to disco in the 70s was was racist and homophobic. Absolutely. And the, there's a real moment in this where you're just going, holy shit, this was really, really awful at the time for the people who were embroiled in it. Um, one of the commentators said... Um, of all the music that they were throwing out, there was one moment where they were throwing out disco songs, records, and then they exploded them at a baseball game mm. in America and they showed the footage of it and and the commentator was saying 95% of that music was black music. And it, it we've talked about this before. We've talked about how, in hindsight, how damaging all that stuff was. Just to see it... Um, it, it, it was really powerful and, and to, they would get, like, BJs were getting bomb threats. Mm. 
planes were being stopped, you know, flown. Planes were, were not flying, that kind of thing. Like it was an awful time. But then also they rode that wave and then somehow got out of it and then rode another wave and then somehow got out of it and rode another wave. It's fabulous and I haven't had more fun watching music documentary in years. And it's, yeah, I don't know why I loved it so much. Maybe... Maybe we just need some more disco in our lives again. Oh, always. Never went away, though, it never did went it? away, but it's I feel like... It's the foundations like need... of all house music. It's, it's... in pop music and every other pop song. Absolutely. But I just feel like I need to spend some time in there again. Oh, yeah. I need to open that door and spend some time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> open the Studio 54. I'll join you there. I'll see you there this weekend. Let's do that. Let's do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could stay. Can I remind you that for my 40th birthday, where we came as the year 1978, that was the theme and everyone really turned up. You attended as a disco ball. I did. You were wearing a dis- beautiful disco ball dress, but then you actually had what can only be described as uh, like, you know, when people wear watermelons <laughs> on their head, it was that, but it was a friggin' disco, disco ball. ball. Like someone had just chocked it on your head Loved and it. you looked amazing. <laughs> Loved it. That was my favourite dress up outfit I think I've ever had. You looked incredible. Thank you. You are disco. Ah, and I just I realised I missed it so much. But let's not forget all the other songs they did as songwriters later and the relationships between the brothers. And it's really sweet. And I just, I don't know, I needed something. Like, I've seen so many documentaries which are just, and wank fests and people being boring, you know, like Bono talking about <laughs> someone he doesn't know anything about. I and, knew you'd bring up Bono. And like Justin Timberlake turns up in this, but he's like, <laughs> he's hilarious in it. Like he's just going, I'm not stone right, but their voices together, the brothers, they sound like trumpets. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Like it's, re- it's yeah, there's just a bit of joy in it. So if you need a bit of joy, give it a watch. Well, this is perfect timing because I'm about to get on a plane and if it's the same carrier, which I think it is, It'll probably be on my long haul mm. flight, and I'll be able to watch that dun, on dun, my channel. Try and sit still in that. You cannot. Doesn't you matter. Can tell by the way I'm and when they isolate the tracks, the, the 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 instruments and the sounds in the tracks, and that's when you know it's phenomenal. And it's like, how did they do that? I think I've told you that experience where it was sound relief years ago. So it would have been two thousand and nine, mm. and I'm pretty sure it must have been Barry Gibb on stage with the late great Olivia Newton John. And they were singing, oh, God, what was it? A song that they'd sung together, again, gone gone completely blank. But the person who was mixing that for the DVD release and that timestamps it was the live music engineer at Triple J, Greg Wales. And he had the job of, they got the best live music team in Australia, the Triple J live music team. Of course. Got them to record it and then they mixed it down for the release. And he took me into the recording studio where he was mixing it one day and he's like, just take a listen to this. And he isolated just their vocals. It was ONJ and Barry Gibb. And it just was like, still think about it, shivers. It's just perfect. It was like honey. It's like someone pouring honey all over the desk in the most beautiful way. It was perfect. Yeah. Like that talent is unmistakable and that's the foundations of everything that they did and then they created within this scene that was exploding Mm. some of the best songs ever. I'm so keen on that. Yeah, and they were the best kind of bowerbirds. They basically just took what they wanted or – and I don't think they even saw it as that, but they – they. It, it was like by a process of osmosis, they they took what was around them and the sounds and somehow managed to be the most f-ing successful at it of anyone ever. And it's that they didn't do it just once with disco. They did it like four or five times over. Mm. It's wild. Love it. I'm gonna, yeah. definitely going to watch that on the plane. Yeah. What are you banging on about? Well, I am actually going to Japan for a couple of weeks. Hey, so Bang On great. is going to be taking a break for two weeks, a bang break. Um, I'm going to be on a flight tomorrow. I am. But you said lands in a typhoon, is that right? Yeah, look, I'm just checking the weather because this time of year between August and October is hectic typhoon season. And sure enough, there's one coming for Japan, for Tokyo, around Friday night, Saturday morning. Um, we're landing at 5.45 on Saturday morning. So it's just like... Oof. Okay. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> this is that, you know, what can you control? What can't you control? That's right. What would happen? Did the plane turn A back? lot of turbulence, I think. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and maybe not being able to fly. Mm. I'll keep you in the loop. But um, mainly oh, hope More that time in the lounge, Kath and Kim <laughs> style. 24 hours, just go shopping. <laughs> I'll be sleeping in the lounge <laughs> on Friday night. Um, mainly with those kind of events. Japan sees typhoons all the time. Yeah, like, literally several every year. 
and you always hope that no one's hurt Where on the ground. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Going to go to Tokyo for a few yeah. days, then go down to Hakone, which is like the, I call it the Dalesford of um, It is Dalesford. Japan. I love it. <laughs> I've never been there before. But it's the hot springs yes. and the lovely little lake and, you know, so rear cars and stuff like that. So I'm going to go there for a couple oh, of days. There's a great art park there too. Oh, yes. I've got oh, that in my got list. Good. Just welcome to my itinerary. Yeah, yeah. A bang fam really enjoying this, I'm sure. Are you catching the train up, a little choo-choo up doing, the hill? Do, yes, I've got that little lump. Um, yeah. The, with the Hakone free pass. Did you like my choo It's very cute. <laughs> and then I'm um, going to do a big loop uh, all the way around because Fuji's a big f- off mountain, as you know. Yeah. And pretty much you can't go through it. So we're going to go all the way around, go into the Japanese Alps up in the north in this part of central Honshu and then kind of do a loop down and you will be happy to know that we'll be ending the holiday at Disney Sea. Oh, great. Because you know I love Disneyland. I know you love Disneyland. I'm Disney's... coming around as if, I, as if I wouldn't want to go. <laughs> it's kitsch as. Yeah. And all of this is to say that the thing that I'm banging on about today is a book that I just read slash listened to, an audio book, Convenience Store Woman, which came out in 2021 by the author Sayaka Murata. It's a three-hour read. It's a very short book. Or oh, we love that. To. Yeah, I knew you'd love that. Yeah, That's I'm why I mentioned it. it. You got it? Like, Can I have it now? <laughs> I'll take it with me. I've got a flight tonight. And it is about a convenience store woman, a woman who has worked at a convenience store for 18 years, from when she was 18 to when she's 36. Convenience stores, or konbinis as they're known in Japan, are the place where, if you've ever been to one, they sell the best egg sandwiches. Best sandwiches ever. The rice cook triangles. They're very clean. Convenience stores in Japan are very different to convenience stores here. What are Um, you saying about our (laughs) 7-Elevens? What are you saying? They take way more pride (laughs) in their produce in Japan. Um, And it's this whole kind of ecosystem because they're everywhere. Like people often can do their shopping there. Mm. And this is a... They have good hot food too. They have a really good hot food. They heat Mm. it up for you, all of that stuff. And this is a story of a woman who is possibly on the spectrum, is a little bit of an oddball and is living in a society where in general society, but in particular Western societies, there's expectations about what is normal and what is not, what is expected of people, how you should meet someone and get married and have children and earn a salary and all that kind of stuff. And this book kind of bucks that trend because she doesn't quite understand how to be in the world, but she can figure out how to be in the world by being a convenience store woman, literally by the training videos, figuring out how she's supposed to smile and talk, how she's supposed to greet people, how she can order her day. And that's why I think even though it's not explicitly mentioned, there are some elements of a character who's potentially on the spectrum. Mm. But it's so much more than that. It's a comment on society and how people react when she chooses to have a live-in boyfriend. And I won't give anything away, but it's not what you think it will be. (laughs) And it's just really dark humour, very interesting, a cracking read. I think it's like the 10th novel from this Japanese author, but the first one that's ever been translated. It was a big bestseller when it came out in 2021. I read it because I wanted just to get into that kumbini headspace because I love kumbini so much Mm. and I just couldn't put it down. I was going to read it when I was over there because I like reading books that are um, are set in the places that I'm going to, but I just couldn't stop listening to it. So convenience store woman, it's very good uh, either to listen to or to read. It'll take you three hours. Brilliant. If you read it all in one go. Yeah. I was in the garden, so it was a big garden day for me. That's a big day. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. (laughs) Bloody hell. We've done it. That was a big one. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. I I think I'm quite excited about being away. I I feel a bit dizzy. I think I'm excited for you. I'm like, when do you go tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow we fly into a typhoon, so wish me luck. Oh, yeah, Yeah. definitely. We've already had that conversation. (laughs) My brain is fabulous. See you in a couple of weeks then. See ya. Are you going to get me a magnet? Yeah, I'll get you on a magnet? Yeah. Okay, I'll wipe all my credit cards just so I can bring you home a gift. (laughs) That doesn't happen anymore, does it? No. And sometimes I reckon hotels just did that to piss you off. If you were even vaguely (laughs) annoying, they'd go, oh, no, our door keys, they don't work. Don't put them near your mobile phones. And if if you were in any way annoying, they'd just go and not give it. Have you wronged a hotel chain before? Many. (laughs) Sure, I have. but you know that, and you have to go and go back. You go all the way up to your room, then you have to go back, and then yeah, I'm sure this has happened to you many times before. It has. Hasn't it? I'm like, what? My key's not working. It's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's <laughs> Probably. me. Probably. Sorry. See, see you in a couple. Yeah. Bye, babes. Bang. 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 Bang on.